Hey everybody, Scott Weichel, you're listening to My Kind of Country here on Fish Creek Radio. My guest tonight, recorded with Capitol Records, starting with the Farmer Boys, Rose Maddox and the Maddox Brothers, and he taught Barbara Mandrell how to play the steel guitar when she was only nine years old. After that, he worked for the great Merle Haggard for the better part of 50 years. He is a member of the Steel Guitar Players Hall of Fame and the Western Swing Society Hall of Fame in Sacramento, California, one of the most respected steel guitar players in the business. And it's my pleasure to introduce him to you tonight. Please welcome Norm Hamlet to My Kind of Country. Norm, how you doing? Oh, pretty good, actually. Yeah. Hey, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, it's good to finally get on your show. I know. I guess I, we should have done this a lot sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my goodness, uh, just about 50 years with Merle Haggard. That's uh, that's pretty impressive. Well, uh, I'm not sure how many you know artists uh, carry some of their sidemen uh, you know that long, but uh, I believe uh, Roy Acuff, I believe had uh, you know he, he had. Uh, uh, Oswald, I think he was, he was about fifty years, I believe, with uh, Roy Cuff. I believe you're right. Yep. Yeah. Well, you guys must have liked each other to hang in there for that long. <laughs> well, I think so. Uh, you know, of course, I was the band leader of the group. After about six months, he uh, he said, "Well, I need a band leader to take care of the band, you know, and do whatever needs to be done." And uh, so, uh, actually, it was kind of between me and Roy Nichols, and uh, uh, Roy said, well, no, he said, I don't, he said, I don't really want to be the band leader. He said, so it's, he said, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he, he probably was, was a lot smarter, wasn't he? <laughs> well, he might have been, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he, uh, he said, bus, and load it up, and he said, he said, then show me my bunk. He said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he had it all figured out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes, be, so. sometimes being in charge ain't all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Norm, I'd like to go back a little bit and uh, talk about uh, you know you're you know you were one of the pioneers of the Bakersfield song. You know you were there when it was all happening. And uh, tell me uh, first of all, tell me about the Farmer Boys. Well, the Farmer Boys were. Uh, couple of guys, of course, that uh, actually I sort of grew up with, uh, with one of them, Bobby, Bobby Adams. He, uh, uh, we went to school together in Farmersville, and uh, uh, Woody Murray actually came out from uh, from Arkansas uh, a little bit later, because we didn't go to school together. But... Uh, Anyway, they were they were just sort of hanging out, and they used to go down to this little uh, drive-in restaurant, and they'd uh, go in there and play the jukebox. And they got to uh, got to singing one day. One of them was on one side of the you know building, and the other was on the other. Uh, you know, they'd get to have her, but the jukebox come on, and it happened to be a song they liked, and they just started singing with it. See, and. Uh, one of them started singing the harmony, and the other one was singing the lead, and they, uh, they got to listen to it themselves, you know, and they said, well, hey, you know, we sound pretty good. Or to maybe get together and, uh, you know, start singing together and, and uh, see if we can't uh, do some good, you know. And uh, so that's what they done, and they wound up uh, going down to Bakersfield and uh, getting on her Henson show. He had a TV show down in uh, Bakersfield there, and uh, he was doing it five days a week. And I, so anyway, they went, they uh, started going down and kind of making appearances on that, and kind of kind of getting well known, you might say, you know. Mm-hmm. And so her actually, her Vincent kind of uh, he was he was uh, he was really good and and good actually with uh, Ken Nelson down at Capitol Records in uh, in Hollywood. So. He talked to Ken about maybe putting them on a record, and uh, so they wound up getting on uh, Capitol Records, and, and they started, uh, uh, you know, doing a lot, doing some records and, and traveling around. And they used to uh, actually go out with some of the uh, 
the uh, Grand Ole Opry group, you know, even though they weren't part of the Grand Ole Opry, they still put them on some of those shows. And, mm -hmm. and uh, actually, they, at one time, they uh, they went out with Elvis Presley. He happened to be on the tour that they were on. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, they show you how, how far back that goes, you know, so... Wow, that's incredible. But uh, they were really, uh, they were really good. They, their voices really harmonized good together, and uh, they, uh, uh, I don't know, they, uh, they, they, they really had good uh, personalities. Both of them did it. So you know, when I was working clubs with them, of course we, we really always had good crowds. You know, because uh, basically the people just loved them. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, were you playing steel guitar at that time? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, I, I kind of came down to the end there a little bit because I had worked, uh, I had worked uh, with a friend of mine that uh, I went to school with, Vice California, and uh, him and uh, uh, Gene Shepard, uh, girl singer, you know, and once in Nashville. Mm -hmm. uh, she she was going to Australia High School, and uh, uh, her and uh, Gene Brayton, uh, he has a studio and uh, a recording studio in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we got together in high school. They uh, <clears throat> they wanted to use a steel player, and, and and you know because they was uh, they talked them into having a country music class in high school and I was going to another school actually I was going to Exeter High which was kind of a different direction by area but because I was in their district uh, me living in uh, Fabersville California so anyway uh, they talked me into coming over to Visalia and of course I had to uh, I had to change schools and, and I had to actually drive because the bus didn't go to Visalia from Farmersville. Oh. You had to, you had to, <laughs> to go to Visalia, boy, you had to walk quite a ways to get off the bus to go to Visalia. <laughs> so, uh, Dad said, well, you know, if you want to go over there and, uh, you know, play, play music, he said, but he said, that's what you kind of like to do anyway. So, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> I had done. I uh, got to play in the music with a friend of mine that lived across the street in Farmersville. His name was Lloyd Massey. Uh, he, he told me, he said, you know, if you get your folks to buy you a guitar, he said, I'll teach you chords. He said, because he said, I like to play a lead guitar. He said, that way you could uh, play me some rhythm guitar and I'd, you know, I'd play the lead. So, so I've done that. Uh, like I said, that, that's kind of how, uh, uh, Gene Breeden heard about me, you know, he heard that, that I was playing steel guitar, because I'd, I'd originally went with uh, with a guitar and played chords, and then we found a guy that played rhythm real, real good, sang good, so I started trying to play the steel, because I loved the sound of it. Yeah. Now, now at that time, it, there wasn't, they didn't have the pedal steel like they have today, right? It was just kind of a, like one on legs, is that what it was, or? Yeah, it was. I just uh, I, I had me a little uh, triple neck Fender steel guitar, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, I played it. And uh, we, uh, like I said, we we got a chance to play music in high school. You know, like like you have your bands. You know, they'd have band practice, and they'd also have an orchestra. You know, where they had, you know uh, an orchestra playing for an hour every day, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we had country music every day. We had an hour of country music, and we uh, we had to teach some of the uh, other kids though, uh, what we knew about playing, you know, steel guitar or the rhythm guitar or lead guitar and things like that. We even had actually piano players and, and drummers and stuff like that in the class, you know. But... Uh, we had, you know, we didn't really have a teacher uh, because none of them knew about country music. <laughs> so we, we kind of had to, you know, sort of get our own thing going, you know. Yep. 
<laughs> well, tell me, uh, we have a, a mutual friend that uh, passed away just not too long ago, Jerry Hendricks, and uh, mm -hmm. he has uh, he has or had the uh, steel guitar that belonged to Barbara Mandrell that she got from you when she learned how to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, bought it from her. He went over to her, her mom's house and bought the steel guitar and he said the first thing I did was get out some gas and take her name off the front of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that thing is uh, I've, I've seen it uh, tell me yeah. about, tell me how you came to uh, know Barbara Mandrell and, and uh, how you worked with her well uh, that came about with uh, the farmer boys because we were working down in Lancaster California at a club and uh her dad uh, at the time, see, they'd moved from, uh, they came from uh, uh, out from Texas. Uh, they they was, uh, uh, at that time, her dad was a uh, policeman. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of town now. I'm getting, getting so old I can't remember some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, they, uh, Corpus Christi. He was a policeman in Corpus Christi, but I, I don't know. I never did find out exactly why they picked up and moved. Uh, you know, but they they wound up coming out to California, and he he wound up as a security guard out at the uh, Edwards Air Force Base out there on the desert, uh, and uh, around uh, close to Mojave. And um, so anyway, uh, we was playing this little club that was about oh, it was, it was sort of between Roseman. California and Lancaster and uh, as you go past the club there was a, one of the big large horn speakers out you know up outside where uh, you could hear the music that was going on inside mm -hmm. so when he'd go to work actually he went right by the club and so he kept hearing music and of course the steel guitar and so one day he stopped in and he says, you know, he said, I've, I've got a little girl. He said, she's about nine years old, going on 10. And he said, uh, he said, she plays music already. He said, she plays saxophone, but she wants to play a, a country instrument. She, he wants, she wants to play steel guitar. She loves the sound of steel guitar. And he said, I can't find anybody down here, uh, you know, that can teach her uh, or even knows how to play one. You know, so he uh, he told me he says, you know, he said he said, boy, if he'd uh, teach her, you know, how to how to play that thing, he said, uh, you know, uh, he said I'd sure be appreciative, and he said, of course, I'll pay you, you know, and uh, and because he said, boy, I just I can't find nobody, and he said she wants to, you know, play that thing so bad. <laughs> so I told him I said, well, no, I, I said, you know, I you don't have to pay me. I said, but I'm. I'm down here, uh, you know, we was playing the, down there on the desert uh, four days a week. And we just, we just go down and we rented a motel room, you know, that had four beds in it because it's four of us and, you know, in the band that, that the uh, farm boys had. And so, anyway, uh, I just told him, I said, you know, we're down there four days. And I said, you know, I, I'll, I said, what I'll do is I'll come down there and because uh, I had my car, you know, we we had to drive down from Farmersville down to down to uh, Roseman, Lancaster area. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I uh, I told him I said, you know, it, if, uh, I said if I, I can make it over to your house, I said I'll just uh, I'll just teach her as much as I can, you know, that I know on the steel guitar. I said, I really wasn't a teacher at that time, or I didn't know how to teach anybody uh, how to play because I, I kind of learned it myself. You know, I didn't really, there wasn't nobody around close where I lived either. Mm -hmm. I just used to go watch the different ones that would come through town, you know, and uh, and I'd go watch their steel player play, and I would sure ask a lot of questions. <laughs> but anyway, what happened, I, I when we get through playing at night, the farmer boys, I would go over to uh, to their house, Mandrell's house, and uh, he had a room there for me. And he said, you just go in there, and he said, shoot, he said, you just go ahead and sleep until you get up. And he says, when you do, he said, maybe you can show her some things on steel. And 
And then he said, well, it's time for you to, you know, to go and do your thing at the club. He said, yeah, you know, just go ahead and go. And he said, that way, he said, she'll, she'll get a lot out of it, I believe. And so anyway, I started teaching her. And uh, it wasn't too long, but I don't know, probably about a year later, uh, not that I taught her all the time at that at that point, you know, but uh, about a year later, she was doing a show, a uh, TV show down uh, down in L.A. Uh, called the Town Hall uh, Party, and uh, and she'd appear on quite a few of those, you know, any TV shows that was down in L.A. She'd wind up on them because she was, you know, she was so small anyway. And then here she is playing that big guitar, <laughs> uh, you know, and everybody just thought she was just cute as a bug, you know. Well, yeah. folks, this is my kind of country. You're t we're talking, uh, visiting with Norm Hamlet today. Norm, how did you first become aware, and what was your first encounter with Merle Haggard? Well, <clears throat> uh, I was actually still playing with the Farmville Boys at the time. And like I said, we were working four nights a week and uh, out there on the desert. And <clears throat> Fuzzy Owen who was Merle's been a long time, of course, manager, uh, first manager, and, uh, and the first one to record him, actually. Uh, we knew each other for quite some time. Of course, we was both steel players, uh, Fuzzy plays steel, and uh, so we knew each other, and uh, he was playing at a club in Bakersfield called uh, Lucky Spot, and he wanted to go back and visit with his folks in Arkansas, and he, he said, I, you know, he said, I need to, need to get somebody to take my place on a Sunday night and a Monday night. And he said, uh, he said that way, he said, uh, uh, he said, I can go on, uh, you know, back to visit with my folks. And uh, he said, if you do that, he said, I'll be gone a couple of weeks. And so, of course, what it mattered, you know, it was like two weeks, but I only had to play four, four nights, actually, you know, because I played Sunday night and Monday night yeah. uh, for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the first night I went in there, uh, you know, to take Fuzzy's place, uh, because uh, see, we, we worked out on the desert like Thursday through Saturday, and uh, so when I go back through there, I would just stop in and and, and play the lucky, lucky spot, you know. So anyway, I went in there and I sat up and got ready to play and everything, and I and I knew some of the musicians there in the in the uh, band, but. Uh, I had never met Merle before, and Fuzzy had hired him to play bass and sing. So that was the first time I'd ever met Merle. Uh, he had hired him, you know, to sing and, and play bass, and then, of course, I can see why he did. Yeah. So we first, when we first started up and started playing, you know, uh, Merle, he started uh, different ones. They'd uh, request different songs, maybe one by Lefty or maybe one by Hank Snow, and Marl, why he wind up uh, saying that just like them. <laughs> I mean, impressions, you know, yeah. impersonation. And uh, I thought, well, boy, this guy sings great. You know, I mean, he, boy, he doesn't, sing, he doesn't sing flat or sharp or anything. I, You know, he just wore right on key. And uh, so, boy, all through the night, you know, he just kept singing the different ones. And he'd maybe do a... Uh, he'd do a Marty Robbins tune, and he's boy, he'd sound just like Marty. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then of course, naturally, he'd go back to his own, you know, his own voice. You might say, you know, and, and I'm thinking, man, this guy is—he's a great singer, man. He he ought he ought to be on records, you know. And uh, boy, I'm thinking this, and then when we get through with the first night, Merle asked me. He says, you know, he said I, I really like to play it. He said that. He said, you know, Fuzzy's getting ready to record me. And he said, if I uh, can get something going, he said, uh, he said, would you like to go out on the road? And I said, sure, I would. I said, you just give me a call, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, like I said, that's the first time I met him. And uh, that, was, that was somewhere, I think, in the neighborhood of around 64, I believe, 65. Uh-huh. Then when did you become a permanent member of his band? Now, Fuzzy Owen was playing steel for Merle up until that point. Is that right? <clears throat> well, he he had actually uh, took uh, Ralph Mooney out there oh, okay. for a while with him. Then Ralph now Ralph played on a lot of the uh, the first uh, the first albums, right? 
Yeah, he played, the, of course, Ralph played, a, you know, a lot on, of course, on uh, uh, Buck Owens, of course, and, uh, and, uh, uh, shoot, uh, what are the names, just uh, completely. <laughs> That's okay. He played on a lot of them, I know that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, he played on a lot of stuff at Capitol Records, but anyway, he played on Buck stuff, and he played on Merle's, some of Merle's stuff, you know, when he first started. And uh, mm -hmm. so, anyway, Merle, he, uh, I was, I was still playing a, a lot around Bakersfield there in the club, and because I was kind of taking uh, Fuzzy's job, you know, uh, Fuzzy would leave one job, he called me to come in and fill in for me. <laughs> so I wound up doing that, and uh, I was, I was playing a club like seven nights a week. Uh, in Bakersfield, and I was going and doing a TV show five days a week at that time. He was. But uh, Burl, he'd, he'd started out on the road, you know, because he'd recorded it, because he'd recorded him. And, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, Burl, he'd come in, he'd say, well, he says, you know, when you go out on the road, uh, you know, he said, uh, you told me you'd be willing to go out on the road, you know, and when I got something going, and at that time, shoot, he'd cut uh, two LPs, you know, then. And uh, and like I said, uh, Ralph had been out there for a while, and then Fuzzy was, he was filling in, kind of in. So anyway, one day they came in, and they said, you know, uh, I've got to have Stu Blair out there. He said, Fuzzy is my manager. He said he drives the bus. He said he works on it. And he said he, you know, he collects the money, and he said he's got all these different jobs. And he said, I need some, I need Fuzzy to be my manager. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need a steel player. And so he said, we're going to get a steel player. He said, now, you, uh, he said, the job's yours. But he says, we need you to, you know, to go out there now. He said, we got to have somebody now. So he said, I'm offering it to you now. And he said, if you don't do it, he said, I'm going to hire another steel player. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned that uh, shortly after you joined uh, Merle on the Road, you became the uh, the band manager. What what exactly were your duties as as the the band manager through the years? Well, it it uh, pretty much just uh, you know taking care of the band, making sure that everybody was uh, on time and you know ready to go, and uh, if we were everybody was dressed, you know the same because we. At that time, we all wore uniforms, you know, the Merle Mock Forest from uh, Nudies down in Hollywood and uh, different uh, ones. Uh, we got some from uh, some other uh, other clothiers, you might say. Uh, I can't remember their names. It's been so long, but I do do. I, I know that we had some Nudies clothes and suits, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I made sure that everybody was dressed alike, of course, and, and everybody's on time. And, and of course, I had to take care of all the boys if they needed to draw money or uh, just, uh, you know, uh, I even helped drive the bus, even. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, did you, but, were you responsible for finding musicians and hiring and, and firing and all that kind of stuff, or was that all up to Merle? Well, I knew quite a few musicians, and some some he had at yet, you know. And so, when we would, uh, you know, need to change uh, band members or something for for whatever reason, uh, I would, of course, always mention different ones to him and say, you know, who you know, who do you think would be the best for the job? And uh, and then we, you know, a lot of times we try to go watch a play you know, before we hired him. Mm -hmm. And so we'd wind up doing that. It, uh, that's that's the way we'd get new, mem you know, new members. And, of course, we'd get uh, input from some of the other guys that were in the band also. Mm -hmm. Well, it must have been quite a, you know, quite a uh, balancing act for, you know, having that many people on the road and trying to get along with everybody and and uh, making sure everything fit the way it was supposed to. You know, that's quite a, quite a task to undertake. It, it was actually, and uh, I, you know, you just have to do that. Uh, somebody has to take charge of that. And, uh, of course, I was pretty much in charge of hiring and firing, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much every every band member that we had uh, was was uh, usually had the job until they screwed up, didn't want 
didn't want the job or whatever, you know, because yeah. uh, Merle, he was always uh, good with band members and, and uh, with people, you know, he was, uh, he was a really, really good guy to work for. I mean, otherwise I probably wouldn't have been with him 49 years, I guess. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that says a lot. That says a lot. Yeah, right there. and uh, all the 49 years, I, I mentioned to you know, some people, you know, they asked me, how come, you know, how did, how did you manage to stay with the world that long? And I said, well, I said, you know, we always got along good. And I said, besides that, I, you know, I said, uh, uh, I always done what Burl told me, you know, and it was whatever he wanted. That, that's what I done. And uh, I said, uh, I don't remember ever having a crossword with Merle Ackard. Wow. All the time that I worked for him. Well, the Strangers won the uh, ACM Award for Band of the Year, I think it was nine times. And uh, you guys had, I believe, six instrumental albums <clears throat> together. Hammin' It Up was always one of my favorites. And uh, for many, many years, you guys would open the show with that. And uh, Merle, yeah. Merle would walk out. And you have an album that uh, you sent me a few years ago, and it's, I have it in my hand, and it's one of my prized possessions because you signed it for me, Riding the Frets. Yeah. How come it took you so yeah. long to do your own album? <laughs> well, I don't know. Really, uh, I just, I just, you know, we was doing quite a bit of recording, you know, with Merle, of course. So I just, I just really didn't think much of it, actually, you know. But, uh, but then, of course, some of the some of the different steel players started uh, doing their own CDs, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, maybe I should go ahead and, uh, you know, try to do some things, you know. But uh, we did a great job, and of course, uh, hamming it up is on there. And stealing corn—that was another one I always liked. And uh, Big City, I, I noticed you changed up your uh, when uh, the intro, Big City—not the intro, but the little turnaround before Mar Merle started singing. You kind of added some notes in there. I noticed on the live performances. Well, yeah, I don't know. I kind of kind of decided that I'd put a few things in that I wished I'd have put in on the original record. <laughs> I liked it. I liked it. I noticed it, and I liked it. <laughs> I, see, I was well, paying attention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way it is, you know, with recording, though. See, you, you know, you'll, you know, when you go in to record, you'll play a certain thing, and then, then you get you get to listen to it after it's released, and you, and you think, well, you know, I could really play that a little better. You know? <laughs> And I think most musicians are that way. You know, once once they hear themselves, they think, "Well, I believe I could have done that a little better." You know. And, I'm sure. I'm sure. Of course. Of course and, you know. And you did a fantastic. You did a fantastic job on the uh, Buddy Emmons tribute, the uh, the Big E salute to Buddy Emmons. You did the uh, Invitation of the Blues. Great job on that. Well, I thank you. Um, where can where can folks get your album, Norm? Is it? Do you have it available? Well, about the only place they can get it is from me, actually. Uh, you know, it, it's, I, I just, you know, I don't, of course, it's uh, not on a, like a regular label, you know. I mean, it's just a thing that I've done, and then uh, uh, the only way they can get it is if they if they write to me or get in touch with me, you know, and uh, so. Uh, well, we'll do this. That, My listeners, if you uh, want to get a copy of this album, just uh, let us know, and we'll get you in touch with Norm. How's that? Make sure we get it to you. That, that'd be real good. You know, that way they can get in touch with you, and you can uh, you can give my address, and, and uh, that way they can. Uh, uh, I just uh, I usually sell them for about eighteen dollars, fifteen dollars for the CD, and about three dollars to send it to yep. them. So yeah. Well, it's got so some. It'd be, it'd it's got some great, great so. songs. Of course, riding the frets, the title tracks, sing a sad song, big cities on it, silver wings, things aren't funny anymore, swinging doors, holding things together. Today I started loving you again, and of course the great instrumentals, hamming it up and stealing corner on there as well. So it's uh, riding yeah. the frets, Norm Hamlet. If you'd like a copy, get in touch with us, and we'll get it. Uh, we'll get the information to Norm, and we'll make sure you get it. So it's one to have, folks, yeah. without a doubt. Norm, do you have some favorite songs? that Merle did over the years? I, I'm, that might be kind of a hard question to answer, but there are some that kind of stand out in your mind that you always really just kind of were special that you liked a lot more? Well, I, of course, I always liked uh, Today I Started Loving You Again because that song was, you know, uh, when Merle wrote it, it was 
it's just right pretty much the point you know and uh it it's not a real uh i don't know that it's a real deep song or anything like that but it just hits a lot of people you know and uh I, I just, I love that song, and uh, uh, Merle wrote it uh, pretty much for Bonnie, actually, you know what I mean? Yeah. He, he, uh, he uh, used to tell me that, you know, some of those songs that he wrote, though, he said they're, he said they're, he said they're like a gift. He said, uh, he said they just come to me, and uh, he said, it, some of them, he said it doesn't take over 15 minutes to write a song. Wow. And yeah. he said, I, uh, he said, "I just, I just get the urge," and he said, "It just, it just, you know, he has it in his head." He said, "And uh, it, it, it's one of those things where he, uh, he said, uh, it, it's got to come from someplace else because he said it comes too fast." <laughs> well, and, uh, I understand he's got a lot of recordings that uh, that weren't issued that uh, will be coming out now that he's passed away, and and uh that's something we can all look forward to there'll be new merle haggard music for a long time to come without a doubt yeah i'm sure it will be uh you know because i think his wife will probably make sure you know that uh, that some of those things are you know they're they have a lot of songs up at the studio you know that are in the can you might say things that we recorded that that uh you know that he had so many songs that we just you know, we couldn't release all of them you know right. and uh, right. <clears throat> Yeah, shoot! If we'd have, if we'd released all the songs he he you know wrote and sang, uh, boy, there'd be a mess of them out there. Yeah, amen. <laughs> you know, all at once. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of songs. Yeah, Norm. If it's not too difficult to talk about, tell me about the last show you did with Merle and the last time you got to see Merle before he passed away. Well, the last show we done, uh, you know, we. You know, he'd had pneumonia so bad, and uh, he'd, he'd been in the hospital for a little while down south, and he he was really, he really wasn't feeling good, and, and uh, we had to cancel. Uh, uh, we were doing a date in um, Desert Springs, California, and uh, he they it was time we, in fact, me and the band, and uh, Noel had already done the opening act, you might say, because Noel was... He was getting out and doing songs on the first of the show. Mm -hmm. We'd done our part, and they had a little intermission, and it was time for Merle. And uh, and he was really weak at that time. He he couldn't even hardly get up the steps. Uh, there were some steps in the back, you know. We can actually were parked around back, and there were steps that leaded up to the dock, you know, to go into the where the stage was. And he just. Uh, it, you know, I wasn't out there at the time, but they were telling me about it. Uh, uh, they said that he was so weak that he, that he uh, he couldn't climb up those stairs, and they were, they were only about four steps. And I think he got up to about the third one, and he I guess he decided at that point he they wasn't no way he could do a show because he just he just didn't have enough strength, I guess, you know. Yeah. And so anyway, they wound up, of course, putting him you know in the hospital at that time, and. Uh, and so he stayed in the hospital for quite some time. I, it, it seems to me like it was about, I don't know, 10 days or something like that. And they let him out. And uh, so then he decided that maybe he's feeling good enough to do, because we had about eight, actually eight days that we were supposed to have done. But uh, we uh, we couldn't play all the, I know we had to cancel some of the, the shows because he just wasn't feeling up to it, you know. And so, anyway, there's about four days left on the end of the tour, and he decided that he was that he was going to try to do those four dates. But anyway, we wound up doing uh, three of those dates, and you could tell he still, you know, well, naturally wasn't up to par, you know. But he was getting out there and he was singing. Uh, you could tell that he that. Even his voice, you know, wasn't up to, uh, you know, par, as I say. And uh, anyway, we got time to, you know, do the fourth show, and that was like up in uh, Oakland, California. And uh, when he came out on the show, he seemed like he was, uh, he didn't seem quite as weak as he did uh, on some of the other shows. But uh, anyway, he came out, and then, 
he uh, he done some things, and uh, the show went along, and he actually done just a little bit longer show than he done on on the, some of the other nights, you know. Wow. But anyway, at the last of the show, you could tell he was starting to run down. You know, he was starting to get just so tired, you know, way. And so anyway, he of course left the stage, and and everybody said, well, yeah, when he when he left the stage, they took him to the bus and said he was really, I guess, we're just you know really uh, down, you know, because he's uh, he I guess he just used up all of his strength to kind of get through that show, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of the way it was. I mean, he he just he wanted to give the people a show. You know, he didn't want to go out there and disappoint them because that that's just the way he was. He, he you know the show must go on. And there's uh, there's a lot of times I know that he he's done shows when boy he, he really should have just stayed in the bus really yeah. because his you know he had uh, had breathing problems and and things like that and mm -hmm. he. Uh, uh, of course, you know he had that cancer too, and uh, they they cut out part of one of his lungs too. You know, so yeah. that that made it a little more difficult on him. I'm pretty sure, you know. Yeah. And uh, but uh, anyway, he had that uh, he had that uh, pneumonia for so long, and uh, they were wanting to do. They I guess they'd seen a. Uh, a spot on it, one of his lungs also, and uh, they was they was thinking maybe the cancer had came back, but of course we don't know for sure because he didn't want them. He said I've been poked and prodded and needles stuck in me and so much. He said I he said I just he said I ain't gonna do it. You know they wanted to do a biopsy I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, he just he just told them no I ain't gonna do it. You know. Yeah. He said, "You stuck me all. Oh, uh, you're going to. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I don't know for sure if it was cancer or uh, or what. But anyway, he he uh, he just he just told him. I guess he just tired of it, and uh, and so he just he didn't <clears throat> want to go through it no more. You know. So, mm -hmm. did did you get to see him before he passed away? Yeah, I did, but I, I didn't get to see him alive. Uh, and uh, well, of course he was alive. I mean, but I didn't get to see him and talk to him. You know uh, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, he was uh, basically they had uh, he was in hospice. They call it, you know. Right. Right. And uh, so I didn't get to talk to him, but I of course seen him. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and some of the family, of course, and you know Fuzzy Owens. And, and uh, all you know, his all of his uh, kids, they were they were there. They got to, of course see him, but they didn't get to visit with him. Some of them, you know, some of them had to fly in, and they didn't get there in time, of course, you know, to to basically uh, see him when he was still uh, still awake. You might say, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and I, so, I I understand uh, he yeah. passed away on his bus. Is that right? Uh, <clears throat> I understand he passed away on the bus. Is that right? Yeah, uh, he wanted to be on the bus. He uh, he was up at his ranch, and he didn't want to be. Actually, he didn't want to be in the house. He wanted to be on his bus, and they uh, they set him up. Uh, he, had, he had up in the bus. He had a, a big couch up front, and they wound up. Uh, he 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 was on that couch, and that's where he wanted to be. No, he didn't want to be in the house. He wanted to be on his bus. Wow. And uh, that's that's where he passed away, and uh, that's the way he wanted. Well, the 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 memorial service was, uh, <clears throat> you know, the things that I've heard was a wonderful thing, and it was, you know, it was the way it should have been, the way he wanted it, and uh, and obviously hard for everybody, but uh, a very fitting tribute. Yeah, I, everything kind of went the way he wanted, because, like I said, he had, I think he had, you know, he'd prepared. A list of things he wanted to happen. You know, he wanted, of course, Marty Stewart to to sing some songs, and also Connie Smith, of course, you know, which is his wife. And uh, Connie Smith has been married, to, you know, to uh, to Marty, Marty uh, for quite some, you know, quite some time now. Anyway, he wanted them to be there, and he wanted, to, of course, he wanted Ronnie Reno there too, too, to sing some songs, and. Uh, 
you know, he, you know, had it wrote all down. You know, he had a big list of what all he wanted to happen, and uh, that's that's what they done. They uh, pretty much just had this list, and uh, they just went down the list and said, okay, this is the song he wants sang, and this is what he wants done, and you know, and so. Like I said, it was you know it was a private uh, private funeral. It was just strictly uh, fa- you know friends, close friends, and and family. That's yeah. about it, all it was. Because and that was that there was a lot of people there, you know, at the at the ranch. Sure. And uh, uh, like I said, just people with their name on the list. That that's all they let in. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, like I said, it was pretty much the way he wanted it. So uh, oh, that's good. That's uh, good. We had so many great times over the years, and it was always uh, it was always nice to be able to talk, you know, especially to you and getting to know you through the years, and uh-huh. and well, uh, it was you know yeah. it was good memories. And the and the last time we were able to all be together was was a great day. My son was with me, and we had such a nice day. And it was it was just yeah, couldn't have asked for anything better for the last time that I got to see you know to see Merle. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, and I want to thank you for your friendship all these years, and. Uh, for all the wonderful conversation that we've had today and taking the time to uh, to talk with me. It uh, it means a lot to me, and I, I want to thank you for that. Well, I uh, thank you for giving me a call and, uh, and, and getting in touch with me so we could kind of uh, reminisce a little bit, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I hope we can do it again sometime. There's a lot more stories I'd love to hear and and uh, love to get them down on record, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, Scott. Well, Norm, it's been a pleasure. We're going to uh, play some music off of Riding the Frets. And again, if you would like a copy of that, uh, get in touch with us here at uh, My Kind of Country, Fish Creek Radio, and we'll pass on the information and get you in touch with Norm and we'll get you hooked up. Norm, I sure hope we get to see you out there. I wish you the very best. Well, maybe, like I said, maybe we'll get to do it sometime. All right. I appreciate it. Norm Hamlet on My Kind of Country. Thanks again, Norm.